Hello, I'm Mark Anderson, and welcome to the first video edition of Stop the Presses. And this is a periodic exploratory news program that tries to cut to the heart of the issues that are often overlooked by mainstream and even some alternative news media. While the mainstream news is sometimes fake, misleading, unreliable, and often shallow, I aim to take on challenging issues that are either totally ignored, downplayed, or mishandled. Having been a journalist for 33 years, I've covered local, provincial, and national issues in the U.S., Canada, the U.K., and beyond, including on Capitol Hill, where I'm credentialed to cover the U.S. Congress. Today, June 5th, 2018, for the inaugural edition of Stop the Presses, I welcome Justin Walker. Hello, Mark. Now, Justin, you're heading up the new Chartist movement, and I found this particularly fascinating because, as a journalist, I have... Um, done a lot of research beyond the headline issues, beyond the ticker tape we get, and the deeper issues. And inevitably, you run into this big wall saying monetary reform, mm -hmm. monetary issues, the issuance of money, and it's a formidable structure. Yeah. It, it seems is. that's the rampart that we really face. And the Chartists are back. I see that on your website. Um, it's uh, a, a welcoming web website. It's very intriguing. It, obviously, it says the Chartists are back. That means they've been here before. But uh, basically, what is the new Chartist movement, and uh, what are we looking at here? What's okay. the basic essence of it? Okay, well, we'll go back quickly, first of all, to the 1830s and 1840s, which were the early part of Queen Victoria's reign. And Parliament was made up of members of Parliament, but it was a Parliament that represented the landowners uh, the mill owners and industry and the merchant class, and you could say the City of London, as it does today, but we'll come on to that. Mm -hmm. And it was all about the fact that ordinary people had no access to put their points of view across, to voice their concerns. Uh, they knew that basically they were not being, they were not being listened to by their so-called elected servants, which they weren't even allowed to vote for. Women didn't have the vote, but most of the men didn't have the right to vote. So the Chartists organized in towns in Newport in Wales, in Manchester, Blackburn, Burnley, Birmingham and elsewhere, and they were just ordinary people who wanted to see Parliament to become completely transparent and accountable to the people, all the people of Britain, which is what a Parliament should be. So uh, they started off and they got a huge number of people, but in the end, uh, the, the state, you could call it deep, deep state, but the state got organized and it was one of the first cases where a railway was used to transport a battalion of troops from London to Manchester to put down what they called uh, the rioting. And, and, and to a very large extent, the, the Chartists were peaceful, totally peaceful. But I think it's fair to say that uh, some agent provocateurs and uh, hotheads who had, had been into the alehouse did get slightly out of control, thus giving the authorities the excuse to clamp down. But it was one of the first cases, well, it was the first case of a battalion of troops using the railways to move in 24 hours from London to Manchester, 200 odd miles, to put down what they viewed as a rebellion. So the Chartists carried on until about 1848 and eventually it petered out as the agent provocateurs tried to cast the Chartists as being a violent, anti-establishment, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and I understand that there was a, uh, like I'm showing here, Fergus O'Connor, mm. a very interesting leader of that group, uh, the, the, the original Chartists. Mm. And what I read was 40,000 people attended his funeral. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because people wanted justice. They recognized a champion for justice. He was a bit of a hothead. But nonetheless, he wanted justice. But he you had to fairness. have passion to do something like you that. You had, exactly, had passion. Uh, and so when he, when, you know, when he did die, yes, a huge number of people turned out. I mean, the Chartists laid the base for the trade union movement. It laid the base for what became the Labour Party. Uh, but I'm not of the left. I don't believe in supporting any part of the left-right paradigm. I, to me, it's all artificial. All I'm interested in is the mindset that controls that basically that, that uh, electoral system and the electoral left-right spectrum. And uh, so this is why the new Chartists now have appeared on the scene, because we recognize, if you like, the problem that the old Chartists had. 
And it's all about how money is created and by whom. And, and if I may interject there, mm -hmm. uh, we have to this day the Remembrancer. And the Remembrancer is the privileged banker's man who from times of antiquity oh, yeah. through the yeah. times of the old Chartist movement, the original Chartist movement, till now, as we see on, on the screen, this overseer of the bankers given a privileged seat in Parliament. So this shows what the old Chartist movement, the originals were up against, and the new Chartist movement that you're helping yeah. Yeah. move forward. Yeah. You're looking at something very established, very esteemed. Oh, yeah, well, you have. I mean, the first remembrancer went into Parliament in 1571. That long ago. 1571 Incredible. under the reign of the first Queen Elizabeth. Ah, And, uh, you know, as I said, they were there. He was there to protect the interests and the privileges of the City of London, the merchants, the merchant bankers. Um, today, I think his name is Paul Double, uh, the City of Remembrance is still there. And this is one reason why none of our MPs will question how money is created and by whom. And the truth is, and this is, this is, the, this is the thing that the Chartists are linking on to two things. First is the Constitution, but we'll come on to that later. Mm -hmm. But secondly, is that the people can control money creation, the money supply. And what do we mean by that? At the moment, we have to be taxed. You have direct taxation and indirect taxation, but mainly direct taxation. And when the, the, the receipts of taxation receipts are outweighed by government expenditure, you then have to borrow from the private financial banks, institutions, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Who create money completely out of thin air as debt? If you and I created money out of thin air as debt, you and I would be serving, well, in your case, and being American, you'll be in some penitentiary somewhere in America, but we would certainly, I would certainly be in prison eating a lot of porridge, as we call it, um, with the keys thrown away. How dare I presume that I can just simply create money out of thin air? And yet that's what the bankers do all around the world. So what a government can do, and in America, Abraham Lincoln <coughs> did this with the greenback dollar, you can actually have the state, the government, create money that's based on the wealth and labor potential, that's your creativity, of what your country's worth. So rather that gold standard where you draw from the amount of the gold you've got, and you draw from that, you can do exactly the same with the actual wealth of your nation. Now that's an important point, and it can be a point of contention among alternative economists and monetary reformers. <clears throat> and I think it's safer to base it on the creativity, productivity, yeah. labor, overall productivity of the people and the, and the raw material wealth of the, yeah. of the nation because gold can be controlled by the city of London, by the central bankers, the private bankers that that rem remembrancer <laughs> represents. Absolutely. And, and they can mess with that. And so when you make it more diffuse yep. amongst the people's productivity, like we're talking about, mm. it's much safer and, and much stronger mm. in the long run, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's oh, it, it is too. absolutely, and you can actually decentralize the Bradbury process. By the way, we call it the Bradbury. Let me just explain to your listeners and viewers what the Bradbury is. The Bradbury was money that was created at the outbreak of the First World War. What happened was, it's quite an interesting story. At the outbreak of the First World War, we won gold standard. And because of the uncertainty of such a major conflagration as was about to break out in Europe, a lot of people wanted to get their gold out. So they took their notes to the banks and said, we want our gold out. Now, the bankers envisaged there was going to be a run on the banks and that the, literally the gold did not come up to how much money was out in the system because they'd been practicing fractional reserve lending. So they knew there was going to be a run on the banks. So they went running off to David Lloyd George, who was then the Chancellor of the Exchequer before he became Prime Minister. And in two days, they had August the 3rd, they had a bank holiday, and so the banks were shut. They kept the banks closed until August the 7th. In that time, Parliament met in an emergency meeting, emergency session, and they passed a bill for currencies, Bank and Notes and Current Coins Act, to authorise the Treasury, not the Bank of England, the Treasury to create paper money that was based on the wealth of the nation. And literally in three days, they printed, first of all, the first batch of the Bradbury pounds, and they were called Bradbury after Sir John Bradbury became later Lord Bradbury, and Sir John Bradbury was the first secretary to the Treasury. So it was mm -hmm. his signature on the notes. 
The first batch were printed on stamp paper on one side only, mm. in de two denominations. One was one pound, and the other one was 10 shillings, 50 pence in our language today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, one pound in 1914 is the equivalent of 107 pounds today. So we're talking quite big money. Goodness. So wow. immediately, when the banks reopened after an enforced longer bank holiday, on August the 7th, there were huge queues outside, and people were told, you're not getting gold, you're getting this government money that's based on the wealth of the nation. And everyone was happy with it. Now, of course, the people today say, you can't just have a government printing money, you get hyperinflation, you get inflation, all this sort of stuff. Well, of course, you don't, because not if the government is then controlling how much money is actually in the system and it retires money and one of the ways of doing that is indirect taxation that's valued added VAT as we call and it. I believe and depreciation too. Depreciation and you can actually put money into the system for a particular project to be retired. I mean there's all sorts of different ways the, the economists can play at that but it's rather like a canal. I liken it to a canal. You have a level water in the canal and you have your <coughs> sluices you have your sluices, which is the means of retiring money, indirect taxation and so forth, that takes excess money out of the system. So you have a nice level canal, the liquidity needed for a vibrant and prosperous economy. So you've got all the money for your national health service that we have here. You have your money for social welfare, looking after the elderly and the vulnerable. You have your money for your defense, looking after all aspects of your defense, Navy, Air Force, and Army and so forth. Your infrastructure projects. Um, and for encouraging people to set up their own businesses with uh, debt-free loans. Uh, you know, it's a huge thing you can do. And of course, the most important thing of all, you don't have to go anywhere near, but in our case, the City of London and the merchant bankers or any of the bankers to ask or to borrow money at interest. And of course, the national debt, and what's interesting is when the Bradbury came out for the first six months, it was the way that they were going to pay for the First World War. But the bankers who were not going to make a killing out of the killing on the Western Front went running back to David Lloyd George says, OK, you've saved us. You've stopped to run the bank. Can we please get back to you issuing bonds? We buying them and loaning you money at three and a half, four, four and a half percent interest, as we've always done. So they didn't end the Bradbury there. They phased it out. In fact, the last Treasury Bradbury came out in about 1926. That recently, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they, given they, when but the war they, was. They weren't, they weren't producing very many. Now, what was interesting is the national debt, which was already standing at 650 million pounds, multiplied by 107, so it was quite a lot of money, at the outbreak of the First World War, which had been arrived at by borrowing thin air money from the banks. By the time the Treaty of Versailles happened in 1919, it had gone up to 7,500 million pounds, multiplied wow. by 107. My goodness. So you can see then the national debt is the way the bankers control governments. If you're in debt in hoc to the bankers, the city of London, it means we control you. And that is why our friend, the city remembrance there, is sitting in parliament, making sure that no MP suddenly says, oh, hang on a moment. Why don't we just do what they did in 1914 and create the money based on the wealth of the nation? Why are we going cap in hand to the bankers in the City of London? And that is why all MPs will not touch the Bradbury with a barge pole. A, a quick question is, the Bradbury obviously has a lot of history. Uh, for purposes of what you call sovereign national credit under mm. the new Chartist movement, why the Bradbury? Do you, do, you, do you like the history that's tied to it? You could issue, you could call for the issuance of another currency and have another name for it. I, I, is it the historical tie? Is I, it that I think anchor? It, I uh, think it's proving to people it's been done before. And, and, that's, and I think, yes, a bit of it's nostalgia. It's been done before, it can do again. It can do, do it, it again. again. Right. I mean, it may be called something else. Well, I'm not in, worried about what the name is. It's the principle. Yes. But I think it's reassuring to people to know that it was done before the, and that, that it was ended by the bankers not because it didn't work. It ended the, by the bankers because it wasn't making money for the bankers. And there's a parallel there. The Chartist movement was done before. It can be revived. You have the new Chartist we have movement. The, new, we, the Bradbury Prime right. was done before. Yeah. And so the historical precedent is set, and it, oh, it gives absolutely. people more encouragement. Yeah. And the same applies to the Constitution, because I remember I said there were two things that the, fund, the Chartists were being set up to do. One is to restore the right of us, the people, to be in control of our own money creation and money supply. But the other thing, you see, politicians throughout the world, but certainly politicians in Britain, in Parliament, believe that they are sovereign. 
that they are making the laws for us to abide by. So politicians like to believe that they're in charge. Well, we've got a shock form. And again, we'll go back in history and we'll go back to the Great Charter, Magna Carta of 1215, which played an enormous part in, in your constitution. Yes. And it's a, it's a great document. A lot of influence uh, and, there. And, and, and that document was only, it wasn't creating common law, it was only enforcing, it was reminding people of what the common law was, because common law in Britain goes back to Alfred the Great, and then before that to the Malmutine laws. It's, it's something that tribal laws... And as the American colonials, colonialists invoke, yeah. excuse me, that ultimately rights come from God and government's only job is to recognize those rights. Absolutely they're right. They're inherent, they're That's inborn. That's right, it's inborn inherent. Right. Now, the first rule of the common law is that you experience trial by jury. And trial by jury simply means 12 people who you don't know, unaffected by, randomly selected people, who will sit and listen to the case both for you and against you and come to a decision, unanimous decision, on whether you are not guilty mm -hmm. or guilty. Right. And that is the fairest way to achieve mm. justice known to man. Man, capital N, capital M. And you could say it's God's given law. That is how it should be done. Now, politicians at the moment are introducing by the back door mainly through ignorance, but in the case of some of the senior politicians, they know exactly what they're doing. They are introducing Roman civil law. Now, one of the things that they are worried about by common law is that a jury has the right to annul bad legislation passed by parliament. If, if a, a, we don't call them laws, they like to call them laws, but we call them rules of society. If they pass a rule of society that is clearly unjust, is clearly prejudiced, or is clearly badly drawn up. It can be nullified. A jury can nullify it. Do they call it jury nullification in American circles? Yeah, we call annulment by jury. Jury nullification can mean something else, twisted language. It can actually mean you're nulling the jury. A jury nullification. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a semantic We, we there, say, yes. yeah, semantic. We, we call it annulment by ju you know, jury. Okay. And, and that way, it means we, the people, are ultimately in charge of how we are governed and by the mm. governance that we agree to, and we have to give our consent to, that we are happy to go along. And if we're not happy with something, we the people through a jury can annul it. Now getting back to the other point, the Roman civil law. Roman civil law is where you have a judge operating as judge and jury. He has no jury to fall back on. Um, the one or two countries like Italy that sometimes have a jury sitting with the judge, but the judge directs the jury. So it's not a jury. It happens in the States yes. too as the juries lose their power. Correct. So what we want to see, well, at the moment, the, what we're seeing in county courts... If you get a jury trial, I'll add. Exactly. That's but it. What go, we're go seeing on. in county courts and what we're seeing in uh, family courts, you're having star chambers, what we call star chambers, harking mm -hmm. back to the English Civil War and the build-up to the English Civil War, where literally you have a judge appointed by the king or the queen uh, who is politically motivated, and he will basically carry out the will of the government or the king or queen and will decide on your fate. And there's many cases of this. After the Duke of Monmouth's rebellion, you had Judge Jeffreys hanging mm -hmm. people left, right, and center and sending people to the colonies, sending people to America. Um, you know, awful. And that is what the common law is. No, you have a randomly selected group of people, 12 people, who will decide your fate. That is the fairest way, as, and the judge is only there as a referee to make sure that both sides in the case have a level playing field to put their case forward. Yeah, governance has always been a, a riddle. We're an absolute democracy, the fear is always that the people will vote themselves into slavery because they won't be properly informed. Yeah. You take the Swiss model, they call it direct democracy, and the people through ballot initiatives and referendums, yeah. they kind of share in the lawmaking. In a republic, we have congressmen that are the same number as when the country had one third of the population. I don't know why the number of congressmen didn't grow up proportionally. Uh, 435 House members in 1920, 435 House members today, that's kind of strange. But in a republic system, they're supposed to obey a constitutional order, so direct democracy isn't really needed except for at the state level. But through the stronger jury system, when that bad law passed by a parliament or a congress comes along, it can simply be nullified. Mm -hmm. And when they pass the laws, if the jury system were where, it, were where it's supposed to be, they would know that in the back of their minds, and it would be a, a check against passing egregiously I, I, bad I, laws. I, I sum up everything up as common sense and common decency 
for the common good. That to me is what the common law is all about. It is about fairness, it's about justice, and it's about taking away any political agenda from any you know, self-promoting parliamentarian or promoting some sort of, you know, like, you know, powerful people, vested interests, trying to find a way into the decision making. It's a way of stopping that. Yeah, and one of the things that I've learned, and I've looked at uh, the social credit movement in the UK and the, and the Dominions mm -hmm. and the American Monetary Institute and different, different uh, monetary reform advocacies and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, finding social credit most preferable to my uh, personal outlook and all that, but all of them, th there's a lot of similarities, and that similarity is mainly to uh, defrock the private bankers of this mm. very untold and, and very unjustified centralized power they yep. have over governments and the people. And, and another thing I've learned in studying monetary reform is, in a way, the governments and the people are both co-victims. It's just that the government is then turned into the kneecappers for the bankers, but they're kind of under the heel of the bankers too, just like we are. And then people tend to attack the government when the government yeah. itself is not always the problem. What we it's have, kind of tricky. It is, but what the, what the Chartist movement, the new Chartist movement, and we'll probably morph ourselves into the Chartist movement again, what we're trying to do is overcome the ignorance both of the electorate, the people out there, but also our decision makers, some of whom I think are perfectly decent people caught up in the party system. Now, and and give the you, spoils, all the rewards. Yeah, and all the rewards. Punishments. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and also the promises of a, a, a place on the board in the City of London if you carry out our... Yeah. The social register. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So what we're trying to say to people, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, my member of parliament is a lady called Sarah Wollaston, uh, probably a very nice lady and socially, but I met her for the first time two years ago when we moved down to South Devon. And I said, hello, Sarah, nice to meet you. My name is Justin Walker, blah, blah, blah. I've just got one question to ask, first of all. Oh, wow. Have you ever heard of the Bank for International Settlements? And her answer? And her answer was, never heard of it. Now, she'd been in Parliament for five years, and she'd taken part in, you know, worrying about the health service, why the funding for the health service hadn't happened, and all the rest of it. But she didn't know anything about the Bank for International Settlements. Now, I asked my previous MV, Tim oh. Farron, Exactly the same question. He'd been in Parliament 10 years when I asked him. My goodness. And he'd never heard of it. Right. Had they ever heard of Christmas? Or well, Santa Claus? this is it, man. You, you're an educated man. You know what's going on. I'm semi-educated, but uh, talk to my wife. She'll tell you how educated <laughs> I am. But no, um, the, the truth of the matter is the Bank for International Settlements, for your viewers who don't know, it is the central bank for all the central banks. It is based in Switzerland. It oversees... 60 central banks, including the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank and the Russian Bank, the French Bank, Italian Bank, and the so forth. The central forth. bank of the central exact. banks. Exactly. And, yes. it, and it's responsible for over 95% of the world's money supply. It has given itself diplomatic immunity. It has all its meetings in secret. And the governors of the various banks are summoned to receive their instructions from the big banking dynasties, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, and the, the big merchant banking families. So all this is about how the world is controlled. And they decide, this one organization decides how much, or more accurately, how little money the world has to spend. So with inflation and with interest being charged and all the rest of it, we have a spiraling downwards of how much money is in the world. So what's the result? We have poverty. We have, well, you, you know what's going and, on and in on the world. And on that note, Justin, I want to show this, uh, the output income slide. Yeah. And this is mostly out of social credit literature, which is very much along the lines of what yep. you're talking about monetarily. You have to have, you have a supply of goods and services, and, but you have to have enough income, as the slide shows, to meet the output. Yep. If that income for whatever various factor goes down, you have a perpetual deficit, even without interest. Exactly. This is what's incredible. And um, Major Douglas, the founder of Social yep. Credit, who worked at the Royal, Royal Aircraft Factory, yep. I believe it's called Farns Bureau? Farnborough. Farnborough, excuse me. Mm. He found as an engineer that as you produce things, the wages are never enough mm. because, of, because of inherent costs. The wages are never Inflation enough to, and stuff. to, to yep. retire the prices. Yep. So you always have price structures and debts going over wages and salaries, mm. and it's built in, and that's even without it's interest. It's a built-in strangulation. It's a built-in way of controlling. So I want to get back to my analogy of the canal. Yeah, then you add you interest. Have... And, and Exactly. And, and it just this is really important. 
a lot of monetary reformers, like you said, like this can't be stressed enough. They say if you add money, it automatically inflates the, the prices. Yeah. But that's only true if there's low production and you're piling the money up and very little is being produced. That's right. As long as it doesn't exceed the level of mm. production, all it does is encourage more purchasing. Factories can sell what they need to sell. The retail stores can sell what they need to sell. Factory orders are fulfilled. What comes off the production line is actually purchased. Mm. Right now, we have full stores and empty wallets. Mm. Full stores and empty wallets will not work. Like you say, yeah. it's slow strangulation for all these factors, and that's, these are the reasons. But that's also that's something else into the equation. We are taught by the economists, by the mainstream media, by our politicians, that we're in a race. We're in a global economic race. And if we don't perform, we'll lose. So you've got every country at each other. All the developed nations are fighting for the market. You've got developing countries now fighting for the markets. And it's all about fighting and competing and trying to get the upper hand over other countries and whatever. Almost as if we're all gladiators exactly, in one big exactly. economic Exactly, that's a good that's a good way of describing it. Yeah. That's a very good way of describing it. We're in the Colosseum. Yes. And you know, the big fact sorry, I think that meant you die and that went I think we've and, got and, it the other way around. But anyway, and that's the point either was, the remembrancer or the head of the Well, exactly. We're the talking, bank for international settlement. Yeah, I am FD, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a bloody good we must remember this one actually after the program. I can I see think. the cartoon already. So can I, so can I. But we've got all these nations. No, that, that means you live, apparently. According to historians, that was a good sign for you if you were a gladiator. That's the bad sign, and yet that's the thumbs up that we anyway, that's another story. Yeah, yeah, we know what we mean. But yeah, exactly, we know what we mean. But yes, so what we're talking about is countries versus countries and economies versus economies what we should be doing is saying right there's seven how many billion how many is it six point something billion at the moment let's think we should all have access to clean water we should all have access to food we should have all that access to warmth and shelter we should also have access to using our talents with something contributing to society as a whole and to the common good we, sh we should be in a peaceful we shouldn't be looking to war we shouldn't be so in other words we want to live in a country where we are all fulfilled in the best ways possible. And you don't do that if you're trying the whole time to be as efficient as possible. And they are trying to make you more and more efficient. And that means you're on the treadmill, climbing faster and faster and faster. I mean, everyone is on a treadmill and you're getting faster and faster and faster. And the only people benefiting from this are the 1%. And we call them the 1%. Actually, it's more like 0.001%. I think, is it something like 60 people, individual people, control as much as half the world's population, own as much? It's, it's under, it, it, it's under it's a few hundred. Quite yeah. it's, it's quite ridiculous. So what we're saying is we want economies where you work with other nations. And I'll give you a classic example is the West Indies produce wonderful bananas, ship them across. We do some wonderful diesel engines and whatever, and we'll ship them across. And you find real ways to trade, mutually beneficial for, for both countries and for both communities. Yeah, lest we enter economic warfare, which can be almost as bad as military exactly, warfare, yeah. and one can lead to the other. Exactly. My view of trade has always been, as, as we begin to summarize this first stop the presses, has been that countries should largely make what they consume themselves. And export a few surpluses that other countries truly need because yeah, they yeah. can't make them or produce them themselves. Yeah. Don't base it on purely profit, but base it on need. And we want human scale industry. We don't want the really big mega oligarchs, the real financial and um, you know the corporate oligarchs dictating to nations and dictating, if you don't do that, I'm going to pull my operation out of your country and you're going to be left with tens of thousands of people unemployed and all this. You don't want the bully boy in taking any part of the, the decision making. You want ordinary, decent people working together and finding out what's best for the common good. And that's not communism, that's not socialism, it is common sense. And, and this is, you know, I'm fed up with all these different names they give. Oh, I'm a, I'm a communist, or I'm a socialist, I'm a capitalist, I'm a... Forget that. I'm a human being. Mm -hmm. And I don't sit comfortably if I know somebody else is suffering because of what I'm doing. It's all about working together. And, you know, the Muslims, they, they have a lovely saying. And, you know, I, I don't go for any one particular religion. I believe there's common good for all, and we should all come together in peace and harmony. But I think the Muslims have a saying which says... Uh, no true Muslim can sleep at night in the village if somebody in that village is hungry. That, that's interesting. I, I've also heard monetary reform cast in uh, uh, terms of the Sermon on the Mount. 
that you know you witness the animals and th that they don't have to labor so hard for their sustenance and that we under the grace of God should not have to labor so hard just to survive no. No. that life doesn't need to be this hard and what we're pinpointing today I think is the major reason why life is so much yeah. more drudgery than it has to be. When was the be. last time you heard a politician say they want to make you happy? Well I've heard it in kind of comical terms <laughs> but not Oh, can I tell terms. you a very good joke I heard, by the way? I, it's a very naughty one, but I do like it. Uh, fire away. Well, we're not what, too what do you, here. Uh, MPs, you know what MPs are. What do you call 100 MPs on the seabed? I might know, but I'm going to let you tell the punchline. Okay. A bloody good stuff. <laughs> and, you know, the less we have of governance and that we the people are trusted to do what is right, this, to me, this is, we don't want the state on top of us the whole time. We don't want the state watching in minute detail what we're doing. That's why they have to have an invasive taxation policy, so they know exactly what you're doing. We have our little holiday business. They're almost asking how many toilet rolls we buy. You know, they bog you down. And, and ultimately, though, they're, yeah. the, they're the collection boys, just like they're the kneecappers for the central yeah. Uh, yeah. financial Yeah, and they have all the ministers. useful idiots who obviously have a mortgage and all the reveries, and so they just do the bidding of these criminals. And so everyone is being controlled in minute detail. And then we've got the technology to monitor everything that's going on, the smart meters, the smart... Everything now is all about watching. We're watching you. It's about we, the tiny, tiny, e tiny... Every majority. penny you spend with your chipped exactly. card. Exactly. And, and, of course, the cashless society, that's something we've really got to flag up. Please, 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 everyone who's watching this today, always use cash as well as the card. I'm not against progress. No, the cards are useful. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with them. It's the, the machinery behind the cards that and needs to be And if they suddenly electronically cut everything off, then you've got problems. Visa the other day, and I believe America had something similar. Yes, that's and true. And somebody says it's a dry run for something much bigger because we're expecting a reset because one of the things they're trying to do is engineer a situation when the people, problem, reaction, solution, mm -hmm. the people will agree to one currency and one banking system and everything else. And our research is heading in a certain direction at the moment, but it's very much work in progress. Interesting, okay. But that is on the cards. The reset of 2018 is on the cards. So I would urge everybody just to keep some cash and some gold under the mattress. Yeah, it's always a good idea the yeah. way these things shut off uh, no, uh, intentionally or inadvertently. Yeah. Uh, also, a couple quick questions as we mm. wind up. Um, I've also heard these sorts of things, sovereign, sovereign national credit, social credit, different names for the, mm. you know, the reissuance of sovereign money, public money that's interest-free, being spent by government on projects. And of course, there's a place for that, but also that consumers could be endowed by periodic dividends. Uh, you know, the idea of a, of a stimulus check that would actually go to consumers. Not, not a universal basic income per se, because that's just redistributing money taxed from one person and given to another. Yeah. But where money would be issued to consumers... But you wouldn't have tax, remember? And not, direct taxation would be gone. You don't need to have direct taxation. Right. Sovereign national credit. Right, but the new money uh, in yeah. some models, such as the social credit model, could go to consumers directly and not always be spent yeah. by government. And in fact, Douglas said this on this next chart, this next quote, Consumer control of production is the only basis of freedom, and no method of obtaining consumer control has ever been tried with success which did not ban state control of money and credit and include decentralized individual, individualized credit power. In other words, there's a place for the people themselves to get some of the money created by the National Credit Office or the mm -hmm. government and spend it into circulation, and they vote with their dollars as yeah. well as have jury nullification, another form of power. My feeling is, and I'm not an economist, okay, and I freely admit that I'm a bit of a dunce to a lot of these things. I was tipped off about the Bradbury by a retired director of the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. He was on his deathbed. He got his son to ring me. He was a director of the Bank of England with my own uncle, who was also a director of the Bank of England, and by the way, went to the first Bilderberg in 1954. Yes, So I was, I was yeah. being groomed, if you like, to work as a useful idiot for the elite. Now, when he told me about the Bradbury, he, he basically his son said, I'm speaking on behalf of my father. He's very elderly, not long for this world. He wants you to know about the Bradbury. He didn't say the pound, he just said the Bradbury. And then he said... If you research the Bradbury, you will find the solution to all of Britain's economic woes. 
And of course, what he means by that, free from the bankers, free from the private sector in the city of London, and the government and the people are in command. Of course, the Bradbury is, is the unit. I'm talking yeah. about distribution. Now, this is distribution. Yeah. What I'm saying is better, cleverer people than I will come up with the solutions for that. But I'm told by two people in particular who are my people who have been researching money for, in one case, 50-odd years, David Pidcock. There is, I mean, Liverpool, the, the, the port of Liverpool, created its own equivalent to the Bradbury back in the 1790s. So it is possible for the Bradbury, the principle of Bradbury, to be decentralized and given the power to regions or counties in our case, or even local communities for particular projects. Well, that, that's, that's what Douglas spoke yeah. of, and I think that's key, because one, one snag could be that even though you'd have the right currency, the government might have too much control over the policy of spending, what gets funded and what doesn't. Yeah, I think the important thing is uh, what we see to us, money reform and our, const and our democracy, our constitution and the law, us the being common the new law, Chartist movement. The, yes. the two things are like that. Right. Because I would not trust the power of the Bradbury to the political parties we have in Parliament at the moment. There's no way I would trust them with the power to totally control H Hence the money. argument for decentralization. Of this is why, and, and we want yeah. independent members of parliament. And in fact, there's a real case for actually saying, well, hang on a moment. Why do we actually need politicians? Why do we actually need a parliament? If you have a civil service who is genuinely working for the common good of the ordinary people and not for the vested interests in the city of London, if you have juries who can annul bad legislation that means the people. We may possibly consider having an advisory council like the Witan. I mean, the Saxon times, they had the Witan, mm -hmm. W-I-T-A-N, the Witan, which was basically wise advisors to the king. And, and they advised. But, you know, it's not beyond the wit to work out how a way, that we find a way where we, the people, reach consensus on how the money is spent without involving, we don't want political parties, because as soon as you have political parties, you have a hierarchy, egos take over, I want to be leader, you can be this, that and the other, and then of course the vested interests talk to those political parties, they offer money to mm -hmm. them, and, and you, before long, you are back to the, back what you've had before. Uh, that irons out a lot of the wrinkles I had in mind, yeah. Justin, and um, I think the New Chartist Movement, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's New Chartist Movement, Dot org dot uk. That's correct. And New people, Chartist yep. Movement dot org dot uk viewers of this first Stop the Presses edition. And as we summarize, uh, th there's a really good quote here from C.H. Douglas, who we spoke about in this show. And I think this is the critical moment. You spoke mm -hmm. about how urgent things are. And he said, to wit, the outstanding fact in regard to the existing situation in the world at the present time is that it is unstable. The breakup of the present financial and social system is certain. A comparatively short period will probably serve to decide whether we are to master the mighty economic and social machine that we have created or whether it is to master us. And during that period, a small impetus from a body of men who know what to do and how to do it may make the difference between yet one more retreat into the dark ages or the emergence into the full light of day of such splendor as we can at present only envisage, envisage dimly. That is a very good quote. And can I also say that there's an American who I owe a lot to, and that's Professor Carol Quigley ah, yes. and his quotes, because he was the one who really convinced me that the Bank for International Settlements is something to be really worried about and something that we've got to break away from. Yeah, he was a very uh, brilliant um, Georgetown professor who was inside yeah. the establishment and basically started speaking out. And they in his alienated, later years. but once they once he'd done the well, not done the dirty, he just basically whistleblowed. And after that, they decided, no, we want nothing to do with you. And they tried to stop his book *Tragedy and Hope* from coming out, but it did come out. And I do recommend people to to read that. It's a very good synopsis of what's happening. Well, any final comments on the new Chartist movement? I, I hope it sounds well, very I, promising. I, I, it, yes, it, it fires out a lot of good cylinders. Well, the, the principles behind it. Can apply to every country in the world. And something that I would say is one of the things that the other side are doing are engineering migration problems and they're engineering people being forced to leave their countries because of civil wars and wars and famines. And, and you're haters if you don't yes, like it. Yes, and, and you know, and you go and try and go and go into another country for a better life. And of course, that then puts the problems on the people who are the indigenous people in those countries. And it's almost deliberate. It is deliberate what's going on. With the principle of sovereign national credit, every country having their equivalent to the greenback dollar or the Bradbury pound, 
every country would be prosperous. And if you have prosperity, people don't want to leave the country of their birth. They want to work amongst their families and friends and their local community. So you would literally get rid of the migration problems that we are seeing all over the world, because those are engineered migration problems. And we can bring them to an end by this simple monetary form of a sovereign nation creating and controlling its own debt-free and interest-free money that's based on the wealth and... And getting the potential. law and the courts in order and everything. Getting the court and getting we the people in control the whole time so we don't have egotistical, self-serving and agenda-driven politicians. And interestingly enough, you know, the, the monetary system is run by tyrants and yet it is so defective and so absurd that only a tyrant could run it. Yeah. In, in other words, it creates the very tyrants that run it. Yeah. Who else but a tyrant would even consider it? Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, you know, and it's, it's a paradoxical thing. And we'll end with this, this slide here, ladies and gentlemen. You were born to do more than just go to work, pay bills, and die. <laughs> yes, I think there's a comedian that says two things are certain in life, tax, taxes and death. Well, I can't solve the death part yet. I'm sure somebody's working on that. But taxes, we can remove taxes just by sovereign national credit. Okay, Justin Walker. Thank you very New much, Mark. I really movement. enjoyed that. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching the first edition of Stop the Presses. I'm Mark Anderson. We'll see you next time on this periodic exploratory news show.